thank you very much. And I'm going to, um, I'm actually going to introduce our next speaker, who is Sal Khan. We're so pleased to have him with us today. He's the founder and CEO of the Khan Academy, a nonprofit that provides free world class education. You may have just heard of him a little bit, right? <laughs> I, mean, I, I should have told him that I actually was encouraging my daughter who's getting ready to take the SAT, like, you need to go on and read the con stuff. And we'll talk later about some of the feedback she might have for you. Um, <laughs> he's the founder of the Con Lab School, which some of you will get to visit on Friday. Khan Academy started as a passion project. In 2004, Sal began tutoring his cousin in math, communicating by phone, and using an interactive notepad. Word got around, and soon Sal was tutoring several cousins and family friends as a hobby. To better scale, he uh, began writing software to assign math practice, provide feedback, and track each student's progress. He also began posting videos of his hand-scribbled tutorials on YouTube, where he reached thousands of students. In 2009, he quit his day job and launched Khan Academy. Today, more than 62 million registered users access Khan Academy in dozens of languages across 190 countries. <laughs> Today, we are honored to have Sal Khan join us to discuss his personal journey of how he founded the Khan Academy and turned it into the organization that it is today. We also look forward to his thoughts on how he has reimagined education and what's next for the future of this field. Without further ado, please welcome Sal Khan. Wow, that's the most generous introduction I've ever gotten. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I, I like to start these types of uh, presentations, and you know, it's really going to be a conversation. We're going to have time, but really, just to get to know y'all. Um, how many of y'all are, are elementary school teachers? Okay. Middle school. Oh, middle. <laughs> high school. And then, how many of y'all are, are humanities teachers? I'm just trying to get a sense. Science. Math. Yeah. Okay, and did I miss anyone? Social studies. Social, yeah. okay, humanities. Okay, okay, all right, social studies, very good, very good. All right, and, and, and it sounds like uh, most of y'all have some familiarity with, with Khan Academy. How many of y'all use Khan Academy? And, okay, and, and how many of you don't? <laughs> good, 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 good. <laughs> and how many of you uh, hadn't heard of it before today, really, or are not too familiar with it? Oh, okay, good, I'm, I'm just doing market research. Uh, <laughs> Well, well for, for those of y'all, it sounds like most of y'all are somewhat familiar with it. Um, we're often associated with this collection of videos that, as was introduced, I started making for family members. But as we'll see, it's a lot more than just videos. Uh, but just to get everyone on the same page, I will start with a montage of what some of these videos look like. All of these interactions are just due to the gravity. This is an age right after Isaac Newton. I'm told the humidity makes it feel hotter. Why is this? Excellent question, LeBron. And you can just see the pleasure he had. The right to privacy as such is not spelled out in the Constitution. Of course, the word liberty is. Two things actually can interbreed, although for these two in particular, it seems like the mechanics would get kind of difficult. And I can keep playing around with these numbers and see what kind of colors I can come up with. If this does not blow your mind, then you have no emotion. <laughs> <laughs> Thought y'all would appreciate Euler's identity. But as I mentioned, it's, it's, it's much more than, than just videos. And you know, some of y'all might already be using it in your classrooms uh, where you know, students can do exercises. It's not just math anymore. It's across subjects and grades. They get feedback. There's teacher dashboards. And I'll talk more about uh, you know, how we envision. And actually, uh, we would love to learn from y'all on, on how y'all envision tools like this could help empower or supercharge a, a classroom. As was introduced, uh, you know, we're reaching a lot of folks these days. But before talking more about this and where we're going, I'll, I'll tell you how all of this started. And you know, even just listening to, to the introduction, I, I have a feeling that, that the journey that y'all are about to go in uh, parallels the one that I've been going through for the last uh, seven or eight years. In 2004, as was introduced, I was uh, a year out of business school. My original background was in tech, uh, but I'd gone to business school. Year out, I was working at a, as an analyst at an investment fund, and I had just gotten married. My family was visiting me in Boston right after my wedding, and it just came out. They were visiting from Louisiana. Where's Louisiana? Oh, very good. Oh, very good. <laughs> we have two teachers of the year at Louisiana. Oh, no. oh, kind of. Oh, one. <laughs> and, and, um, 
And it just came out of conversation that one of my family members, my 12-year-old cousin Nadia, was having trouble in math. Her mom told me about it when Nadia came into the room. I asked her about it. She says, well, there was this placement exam. It had a lot of unit conversion on it. I just don't understand unit conversion. And I immediately told Nadia, I was like, I'm 100% sure you're capable of understanding unit conversion. Uh, how about when you go back to New Orleans, uh, we'll get on the phone and, and, and we'll work with each other. And Nadia agreed. And so, you know, over the next few weeks, every day after work, I'd get on the phone with Nadia. At first, she just was completely convinced that her brain wasn't capable of it. She wasn't really even able to engage in the material. But after about two weeks, she started to engage. She learned unit conversion. She got caught up with her class. Uh, then she frankly got a little ahead of her class. At that point, I became what I call a tiger cousin. And I called up her school. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure y'all appreciate calls like this. And I, I said, you know, I really think uh, Nadia Rahman should retake that placement exam from last year. And they said, who are you? And I said, I'm, I'm her cousin. And, and somewhat surprisingly, they let her uh, retake the placement exam. And that same Nadia, who was being placed into a remedial math class, was then put into the advanced math class. And so, you know, that was pretty incredible for me on a whole bunch of levels. One, it was a way for me to connect with my young cousin who was 1,500 miles away. Uh, this was subject matter that, frankly, I always loved to engage in, even when I was a student, and I was able to share that with a family member. And it was a relatively small intervention on my part, and it, and it might you know, help change her, her future. And so I immediately started working with her younger brothers, Ali and Arman. And a few things happen. Uh, the, the firm I was working for was quite small. It was just me and my boss, Will Capital. His wife becomes a professor at Stanford Law School, so we move out uh, right down the street here. Uh, but more importantly, word gets around the family that free tutoring is going on. <laughs> and so I find myself every day after work with about 10, 15 cousins, family, friends, uh, all over the country on you know, conference lines, whatever, trying to, to help them with their math or their science or whatever uh, they needed. And with a background in, in software, I said, oh, well, you know, I, I see some patterns here. A lot of my cousins, even the ones that are A or B students, and they might be in middle school, they're a little bit foggy on their dividing decimals or, or negative numbers, or if they're in algebra, they're still a little bit foggy on exponents or whatever else. So I started writing this exercise platform. That was the first Khan Academy. It, it had nothing to do with, with videos. And I was showing this off at a dinner party not too far from here. All my friends knew that I had this kind of crazy side project. And the host of the dinner party said, well, this is all cool, Sal, but how are you scaling your actual your, your lessons? And I said, his name's Zuli. I said, hey, Zuli, you know, you're, you're right. It's hard to do with 15 cousins what I was originally just doing with one or two. And he said, well, I have an idea. Why don't you record the, your lessons as videos and upload them onto YouTube for your family? And I immediately said, no, um, that's, that's a horrible idea. Uh, YouTube is for cats playing piano. It is not for serious mathematics. Uh, but I went home that weekend. I got over the idea that it wasn't my idea. And I d d decided, to, decided to give it a shot. And you know, those, those first lessons, and they're still up there. If you do a, a search on, our, on the YouTube channel, at least by date upload, it's November 2006. You know, these were the things that I just thought my cousins were asking a lot about. I mean, it was very simple things, adding fractions with unlike denominators, negative numbers, uh, dividing decimals, just very, very basic things. And I started telling my family, hey, why don't you watch this ahead of time? You know, email me any requests you have, and that way when we get on the phone, uh, we can dig a little bit deeper into things. And after about a month, I asked them for feedback, and they somewhat uh, uh, backhandedly and famously told me they liked me better on YouTube than in person. And, and it's worth introspecting on that because I think there's some things that they were saying and there's some things that they weren't saying. So what they were saying, and, and when you really put yourself in the shoes of a learner, and we've all been there, it makes sense. The first time that you're trying to get your head around something, uh, you know, we've all been there where, where you ask a friend or a family member, hey, how does this work? And say, oh, it's really easy. You know, A leads to B leads to C and blah, 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 blah. It makes a lot of sense, right? And you feel pressure. You're like, oh, yeah, yeah, it, it makes sense. You don't want to waste their time. You don't want, even if they're not judgmental, you're afraid they might judge you. Um, then, you know, an hour goes by or later that night when you're actually trying to do it again, you're like, oh, what did they say? I, I don't quite remember it. But now my, my family was able to, to get it at their own time, their own pace. If they were a, an algebra student or a calculus student, but they were foggy on dividing decimals, they didn't have to be embarrassed. They could just access it at their, at their own time and pace. But what they weren't saying 
is that they didn't appreciate me in their life. If anything, this liberated for more human interactions when we got on the phone. We could focus more on either higher level problems or deeper engagement or really, frankly, what just, you know, the math or, or the science was just an excuse to get on the phone and talk about what was going on in their lives. And so I took that as positive feedback and, and I kept going, kept uploading to, to YouTube and uh, you know, it, it just happened to be public. And it soon became clear that uh, there were people who were not my cousins who were watching. And <laughs> At first, you know, I just see the view count grow, and it was growing quite fast. And then the comments start to come in. A lot of those early comments were just simple, uh, thank you. Even that I thought was a pretty big deal. I don't know how much time you spend on, on YouTube. Um, <laughs> m most of the comments are not thank you. <laughs> a little edgier. <laughs> and, 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 but, but then they got intense. Uh, you know, started getting comments like, you know, I thought I, I hated math, but now I was able to fill in this gap. Or, uh, you know, th this is the reason I was able to get an A on my, on my physics exam. Or, you know, I never thought I was a science person, but now I want to go become an engineer. And so, uh, you know, it was pretty impressive. You know, in those early days, this was probably spring of 2007, this really incredible letter from a mother uh, came through the YouTube messaging thing. And, and I, I, I brought my wife over. I was like, this is, this is incredible. She wrote that both of her sons had a learning disability. And, and these videos were the only way that they were able to keep up with her, their class. And because of that, her and her entire family were praying for me and my entire family every night. And, and you can imagine how, how powerful and, and strange that was for me on some level. You have to remember, I was an analyst at a hedge fund. I was not used to people praying for me. <laughs> At least, you know, at least, at least in that way, and so, and so I, I, I kept going. You, you, you fast forward uh, to uh, fall of 2009. There was about 50, 50 or about 100,000 people who were using the software and and the videos every month. Frankly, you know, I, my, I wasn't even focusing on my day job. Every day I was focused more on requests I was getting from all over the world. Uh, uh, you know, what's the next piece of content or, or exercise I was going to write on the software platform. And it felt like there was something real here. Hey, if, if it's reaching 100,000, maybe it could reach one day a million. Maybe one day it could reach 10 million. Uh, much, you know, I wouldn't have even imagined numbers like this. And so my wife and I sat down. Our first child had just been born, but we had a, some savings, essentially for a down payment on a house. Uh, but we said, hey, you know, it looks like there's something real here. Why, why don't I give it a, a, a shot? And so I quit my day job and uh, set up Khan Academy as a, non, as a nonprofit. And anytime you do anything entrepreneurial, uh, whether it's for-profit or non-profit, you almost have to have a delusional optimism when you, when you start. You know, it's like surely, the, in this case, the social return on, in, on investment is just off the charts. Uh, you could reach so many people around the planet. And I started talking to, to some philanthropists of some foundations. But very quickly, you, you kind of come to terms with the reality. You get a lot of, oh, this is really interesting, but it's not quite what we fund. Or we've already allocated our budget for this year. Um, talk to us next year. And so you can imagine about uh, you know, seven months into that, I had a, a pretty good job before. We were now digging $5,000 a month into our savings uh, with a, a young child in the house. Our, our expenses had gone up. It was, it, was, it was stressful. It was probably the most stressful time of my life. I'd wake up in the middle of the night. You know, what have I done to my family? What have I done uh, to, to my career? And, and I was getting donations uh, off, of, off of PayPal. It was amounting to a few hundred dollars a month. If it was any of you, thank you. Uh, <laughs> but, but you can imagine, it, you know, it, it was tough. Uh, but then all of a sudden, May of 2010, all of a sudden I get a, a $10,000 donation. And see, so I see who it is. Her name is Ann Doer. Uh, she was local. I was in, in Mountain View. She's in Palo Alto, uh, right down the street. And so I, I immediately email her and I say, you know, thank you so much for this incredibly generous donation. This is the largest donation that Khan Academy has ever received. If we were a physical school, you would now have a building named after you. <laughs> And Anne immediately replied back and said, well, you know, um, I use it myself. I use it with my daughters. Uh, I see that we're, you're, you're nearby. I would love to meet with you and learn more about what you're up to. And so about three or four days later, we're at an Indian buffet restaurant in, in Palo Alto. And um, Anne asked, so what's your goal here? And I told her, when you fill out the paperwork with the IRS to be a nonprofit, there's a part of the form that says mission colon. And they give you about a line and a half. And I filled out a free world class education for anyone anywhere. And Ann said, well, you know, that's ambitious. Um, <laughs> how do you see yourself doing that? 
And, and I, I said, you know, just to be very clear, this is a mission. I, I don't plan on being able to just, you know, check it off this weekend and then move on to healthcare or something. <laughs> I have some ideas. Uh, but, but I showed her, you know, I used to walk around with a big stack of these testimonials that I was getting. I showed her the chart of how people were using it. Uh, I showed her the software that I had written originally for my cousins. And I said, you know, this is just the beginning. What I imagine doing is translating this into the languages of the world. I had some very basic teacher tools that, that frankly, I, I was using. And there's actually a few teachers that I knew that were, were starting to use it, where I said, hey, look, in this world, a teacher could know where every student in the classroom is at. It could happen anywhere in the planet. It should be free, accessible, et cetera, et cetera. And Anne said, well, you know, you're surprisingly making a lot of progress. I only have one question. How are you supporting yourself? And in as proud of a way as possible, I said, I'm not. <laughs> and so she, she processes that. Uh, we, you know, we pay the bill. We part ways. Ten minutes later, uh, I'm, I'm driving into my driveway in Mountain View. And uh, I get a text message from Anne. And it says, you really need to be supporting yourself. I've just wired you $100,000. So that was a good day, a little, little bit, a little bit. And then frankly, that was the beginning of a whole series of, you know, a whole cascade of, of events. Uh, you know, at that early stage, actually so, some folks from Google started to reach out and say, hey, we're curious about what you're doing. It turns out a lot of our executives are, 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 have been using Khan Academy with their children. It seems like there might be something interesting here. Um, you know, I, I remember Alfred Spector, who was the head of research, he also was able to, to donate kind of at, at the, a, a reasonable scale too. So I was like, wow, well, at least I could, I could do this, at least for maybe another year, year and a half. And then about, this is now June of 2010, about six weeks after Anne's donation, I was running a, a summer camp not too far from here. And the reason I was running a summer camp is, you know, I never imagined that this, you know, the virtual stuff is somehow in competition with the physical. It's not like Amazon.com versus, you know, Barnes and Nobles. I always viewed this as this could liberate the physical. If you can get, you know, explanations at your own time and pace, if you can get as much practice as you need, feedback, tools for teachers, then what can, when, when people get in the room, they can interact, they can have uh, dialogue, they can do simulations, uh, games, whatever it might be. And so that's why I was running this summer camp to experiment with that. And so I was in the middle of one of these simulations. I had six seventh graders playing a game of risk while the other 20 traded securities based on the outcome of the game of risk. It's a good game. And wh while that was happening, I, I start getting text messages from Anne, which you can imagine I now take very seriously. <laughs> and there were, there were five or six of them. It wasn't clear what order they came in, but they, they read along the lines of, and this is Anne writing, um, I'm at the Aspen Ideas Festival, I'm in the main pavilion, uh, and uh, Walter Isaacson interviewing Bill Gates, Bill Gates' last five minutes talking about Khan Academy. So I didn't know what to make of this, so I immediately boot the near seventh grader off of a computer, and I'm, and I'm, I'm looking for some evidence of, of this thing that Anne seems to be writing about. And about 10 minutes later, I actually was able to find the, the live stream, and, and this is what I saw. There's a new uh, website that uh, I've just been using with my kids recently called Khan Academy, K-H-A-N. Just one guy doing some unbelievable 15-minute tutorials. My favorite vignette is that guy, uh, Salman Khan. He was a hedge fund guy uh, making lots of money, and he quit to do these little web videos. And so we have moved, I'd say, about 160 IQ points from the hedge fund category into the uh, uh, teaching uh, many, many people in a leveraged way category. So, you know, that was a, that was a good day, uh, the day that his wife let him quit his job. Yeah. You, you can imagine what was going on in, in my head. I mean, I was literally shaking. I was like, is, is this really happening? And, and I, 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 was, I was nervous. I said, you know, th those videos were for Nadia, n not Bill Gates. <laughs> and, you know, and he, he clearly knew about it. I mean, he's talking about my wife. And, and <laughs> that, I, remember, I remember dinner that night with my wife, and, and, I, and, and I showed her this video. And, and, and I was just like, what, what do I do now? Do I call him? <laughs> I, assuming he's not listed. And they, they left me in that, that limbo state for about two weeks. Two weeks later, I'm in my walk-in closet, about to record a video, and, and I see my cell phone rings. It's a Seattle number. I, I answer it. Hello? Hi, this is Larry Cohen. I'm Bill Gates' chief of staff. Uh, you might have heard that Bill's a fan. Yeah, I heard that. 
And if you're free in the next few weeks, we'd love to fly you up to Seattle and learn, learn more about what you're doing, maybe ways to work together. And I was looking at my, my calendar for the month, completely blank. <laughs> I says, yeah, yeah, maybe next Wednesday, got to cut my nails, do some laundry, but I, I think I can meet Bill Gates. Uh, so, so we had that meeting, and it was eerily similar to the meeting with Anne. Um, uh, what would you do with more resources? I would build out the software platform so students can learn at their own time and pace, kind of the dream of differentiated instruction. I, would, you know, I had these nascent tools for teachers. I wanted to make them way better so that it was accessible to every teacher on the planet, uh, internationalize the content, et cetera, et cetera, cover well beyond math. And, and so, uh, and, 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 and they seemed to be kind of sympathetic to the cause. At the exact same time, those early conversations with Google, uh, they brought me in and they said, hey, there's this 10 to the 100th project where we want to fund uh, 10 pro we're going to give $10 million to projects that could change the world, and we're interested in Khan Academy potentially being one of those projects. And so all of us, and what would you do with more resources? I told them the same thing. I would internationalize it. We could reach millions one day. And so all of a sudden, October of 2010, uh, the Gates Foundation and Google each gave $2 million uh, to essentially allow Khan Academy to become a real organization, get office space, start hiring up a team, et cetera, et cetera. And ever since then, we've, we've been we've kind of you know, uh, able to grow as, as an organization. And what, we've, um, what we immediately started working on with those resources was the, the software platform. And what you see here, and so it sounds like some of y'all use it in their classroom, you know, these are just examples of what at least some of the math exercises uh, look like on, on Khan Academy. But I use this as a framework to just think about this idea of, of mastery learning, which you know, people talk about in ed schools, but it's, it's really hard to implement. Uh, in a traditional academic structure, the one most of us grew up in and then maybe still operate in, is you group students together by age, and then you move them all together at a, at a set pace. And what will typically happen, let's say, you know, this is a unit, I guess it's, it's you know, this is on equation of a line. So let's say we're in a, a Algebra 1 class, and the first lesson is, you know, this is how you calculate the slope. The, the teacher will give a few lectures on it. There'll be homework every night, lecture, homework, lecture, homework. Then we get a, a test after about two or three weeks. And then on that test, let's say I get a 70%, you get an 80%, you get a 95%. Even though we identified gaps on that test, I didn't know 30% of the material that happened to be on that test. Even the A student, it could have been a careless mistake or maybe it was something really important. You know, what, what's the slope of a vertical line or a horizontal line? Uh, even though there was that gap, the whole class then needs to move on to the next concept. It's not the fault of the teacher. Every teacher I talk to recognizes that. And they're like, I wish I could sit with those students and fill in those gaps, but I've got to cover these, you know, these 60 standards in these 180 days, so I have to move on. But then when you move on, it'll be on, a, on the next concept. You know, how do you graph a line where you're assuming that the students know what, the, what a slope is? And how am I going to learn that if I didn't know 30% of, of, the, of the, the prerequisite material? And, and to understand or appreciate how, how absurd that, that, that world that we're kind of forced to be into is, uh, you know, imagine if we did other things in our life that way. Say, say home building. So we, we bring the contractor in, say we've been told that we have two weeks to build the foundation, do what you can. <laughs> so the contractor does what they can, maybe it rains, maybe some of the supplies don't show up. Two weeks later, you bring in the inspector, the inspector looks around and says, okay, you know, maybe the concrete's wet over there, that part's not quite up to code, I'll give it an 80%. Say, great, that's a C, let's build the first floor. <laughs> Same thing, we have three weeks, we've been told by the state, you have three weeks, do what you can. So do what you can, it's an 80%, 20% gap, fine, let's build the second floor. And then all of a sudden while you're doing that, the whole structure collapses. And if the reaction to that is what we typically have in the public discourse in education, they're like, oh, well, maybe you needed a better contractor, or maybe you needed more inspection. But that wasn't the problem at all. You could have had the best contractor on the planet, and you could have had the best inspection on the planet, but it was the process that was flawed. You're artificially constraining the amount of time this incredible contractor had to work on something. You took the trouble of measuring it, but then when you identified gaps, you did nothing on, about them, and, and, then, and you forced the contractor to build on top of it. And if, if I was giving this talk you know, 30 or 40 years ago, it would have been like, yeah, but there's no other practical way or economical way to have 30 students uh, being taught. But what's exciting now is you know, these, uh, the, the dream of personalized learning and, and mastery learning is like, hey, you know, there, we can start to have tools that can empower teachers so they don't have to make that trade-off, so that they can actually address students' gaps as they emerge and allow students, you know, some students are ready to move on, let them move on. If some students need more preparation, let them work on that preparation. 
to get a sense of, of how it, it can affect a, a, a classroom, uh, this is uh, one of our, our, our teacher partners at, at Phillips Andover Academy uh, who teaches calculus. We have this big moment, and the moment is that for 35 years of my teaching career, I walked into the classroom having no idea if the kids had done the homework or how, how, uh, what their commitment was to the subject. And then suddenly there's this coaching platform on Khan Academy that was a total game changer for me. I wasn't imagining that the Khan Academy calculus content would become uh, a, what, a, a big part of our curriculum. I imagined, frankly and wrongly, that we'd use these exercises, suggest kids use it for review. And it, when we discovered the coaching platform and how powerful that was, um, a, a group of us uh, said, let's give it a go. Let's try using Khan Academy um, as a major part of our curriculum. And uh, my goodness, it changed the way I teach. Um, for instance, uh, five minutes before I walk into class, I can go to the platform and I can look through my list of students to discover that all but two of them had done the homework, had watched the videos, had cleared the, you know, had cleared the hurdle, if you will, of the exercises that I had given them. So when I walked in the room, I didn't have to go over homework anymore. And that was liberating. Um, and so if there were two students who didn't do the homework, it gave me the opportunity to pull them aside and say, hey, I see you didn't get to it, or I see you struggled with it. Is there a way that, uh, that you and I can meet later today? It's because I, I don't want you to get behind in this. And the first 15 minutes of class now, all of a sudden we're breaking new ground. We're doing harder problems. And uh, the kids responded so well to it because I think they had years and years and years of math teachers going over the homework for the first 15 minutes of class. And the poor kids must have been bored to death. Or why bother doing the homework? Because he'll do it on the board anyway. So that was just totally liberating um, and uh, gave me an opportunity to really th think hard about teaching. Since we started using Khan Academy, the one thing that uh, we can't help but notice is that we're having more kids uh, make it to the end of BC Calculus. And it's clear to me that we're having uh, more girls and more underrepresented kids finish our BC Calculus class than we ever did before. And uh, I got to believe it's um, our new way about thinking about teaching and using Khan Academy in the classroom and for homework assignments has got to be a big part of that. And one. And Bill, actually, it helps him and the team at Andover have been major inputs into the calculus work on Khan Academy. And you know, one of the reasons I'm here is we're always looking for people to collaborate with to help work and, and create content together. Uh, you know, another exciting thing that some of you all know about is that, you know, the College Board, and the folks who do the AP and also they do the SAT, they reached out to us a couple of years ago and said, hey, look, uh, we're revamping the SAT so it's actually aligned with the Common Core and what students are actually going to be learning in school. But as part of that, we want to address decades old uh, perception, at least, around this inequity around test prep. And we want to work with you to make uh, you know, the, the world's best test prep that happens to be free. And so uh, this is a, a little video that uh, some of y'all might have, you know, this was on the Today Show, uh, about uh, Khan Academy working with the College Board around the SAT. Today is the last day students around the country will take the SAT in its current form. That's because starting in March, a new test with lots of changes will be there for high schoolers. Here's NBC's Ann Thompson. I wanted to start my own business specializing in robotics. I think I'd like to be a chemist. The first hurdle to achieving those dreams, the SAT. Today is the last day students will be offered the test in its current form. The new SAT promises to be quite different. All 
12 high school students like Amelia Taneo and Minkailu Kanute now also have access to free online tutoring from the Khan Academy. The software itself acts like a tutor. It shows you, hey, you should probably work on this. Complete with points and badges. And once you get to like the more advanced stuff, you get like really cool badges. Sounds yeah. like a video game. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> What's this question asking? Students have been practicing for months with sample tests meant to mirror the new SAT exam beginning in March. And how have you done on the mock SAT? I, I have done well. Um, by the time that I went to mock two, I boosted my so he scores by like by 200 points. Building confidence along the way to achieve new possibilities in the future. For today, Ann Thompson, NBC News, the Bronx. So one of the things that's that's been uh, really exciting about this is, you know, when we started doing the partnership, the college board said, you know, there's this PSAT, and when all of us took the PSAT, it was kind of this random test that you take in 10th or 11th grade. Uh, you know, if you do well, you might get some, you know, letters from colleges and things. But they said, well, what if the PSAT could act as a diagnostic for the practice? And so now when students get their score for the PSAT, which is 80% of American students take, they can sync their accounts. And once again, this is all nonprofit. This is all free. Uh, you know, none of this has a, you know, even a hint of commerciality to it. The PSAT acts as the world's largest diagnostic for uh, learning for your next few years uh, uh, to, the, to the SAT. And there was a, a efficacy study that was released last summer where students who work 20 hours, they double their gains from the PSAT to SAT. They have at least 100 point gains. And it actually keeps going. We know students that, you know, we didn't publish it, but went 30, 40, 50 hours, and they're actually able to, to get more gains than, than people expect. So everything I've talked about so far, oh, and this was, this was the efficacy study there, Idaho, and I see there's connections here. We did a big study uh, in, in Idaho with the Albertsons Foundation where we saw uh, students who completed 60% of their coursework or, or the mastery on Khan Academy, they saw 1.8 times uh, the growth that you would have otherwise expected. Uh, in Brazil, we saw a situation where if the, the students did about uh, 60 minutes of Khan Academy it, as part of their classroom that they saw 30% uh, more growth than expected. And on that last point, uh, you know, everything, most of what I've talked about is, is the world we live in, but what about the rest of the planet? And all of these are, are pictures of Khan Academy being used throughout the planet. They're all really interesting stories. And, and you know, credit really goes to the organizations that are taking it out to the villages. Uh, but probably the neatest story is the one in the top right. I used to give talks like this and say, who knows, maybe one day it will be used in Mongolia, just imagining the furthest place on the planet. And then a few months later, I got a letter from Mongolia. And it's, it's from that young girl in the, in the top right. Her name is Zaya. And at first, she had actually a YouTube testimonial. So I look at her testimonial. She talks about using Khan Academy, how she enjoys math, et cetera, et cetera. And I immediately assume that she must be middle class or upper middle class. Her English was quite good. Uh, she clearly had access to the internet. But then I read the text of her email more closely. And it turns out that there was a group of engineers from Silicon Valley that were using their vacation time to go to Mongolia and set up computer labs with internet in orphanages. And what you see, and what you see in the top right there, those, those are the orphan girls using Khan Academy, and Zaya was one of those orphans. And what's especially incredible about that is, and it just shows you how much potential there's on the planet if you let people tap into it, Zaya has since become one of the biggest contributors to Khan Academy in the Mongolian language. So she's now helping to teach her people. And a similar story that, uh, this was actually in the New York Times about a year ago, uh, it turns out uh, a, young, another, a young girl, 12 years old, lives in Afghanistan, uh, Taliban takes over her town, uh, forbids young girls from, from going to school. I mean, horrible things, threatens them with acid attacks and, and things like this. So uh, Sultana doesn't go to school anymore, but she's lucky enough to have a family that wanted to support her. They, she had a computer. I think one of her uh, brothers got her a computer with an internet connection. And so she uses that first to self-teach herself English off the internet, which sounds a little scary, but it, it seemed to work for her. Um, and and she, she, was, she started telling any family members, hey, can you get me some reading material? And so one of her family members was going to Pakistan, brought back a Time magazine in English. It happened to have an article on, about Khan Academy. So she's like, oh, this is what I, I need. And so she started learning. And so for the next four, five, six years, she goes from like a, a late elementary school level all the way to a high school level. She realizes that she wants to be a, a physicist um, and, and come to the, the US to study physics. So she smuggles herself into Pakistan, which is because the SAT is not av available in Afghanistan, to take the SAT. She does shockingly well. 
And that's when we hear about her. Uh, someone that she met uh, through the internet contacts us. It's like, there's this young girl you could contact. And so we get in touch. We're like, oh, how do we get her into the country to come here? I mean, brilliant. Luckily, Nicholas Kristof from the New York Times hears about her as well, writes this op-ed about her, The Taliban's Worst Fear, which allowed her to get political asylum. And right now, Sultana is in the United States doing research with one of the top physicists at MIT. Thanks. And so you can imagine, um, you know, we collectively want to reach uh, the entire planet. These are all screenshots of, of what Khan Academy looks like in, in various languages. Uh, to, to think about what the videos feel like in other languages, I'll show you this. Me comí dos cuartos de pizza. L'hypoténuse commune, ok. Si, je sais. أرمس هات سيز بلوك كو دكيل لكي كوشش كرناو اس دايركشن مي توجد قطعتين من معدن النحاس والزنك بي اور بتوان دو ضرب دره كي يعني كودا شبا شوكا سيوم شل اضافي خو تخت معجل يخيدا ايلي موز كوليوا انا كوزا اندو قالك فنا كاسياز كوكوبا كوباني 16 بول 16 بيرا اشيتر موتز 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 اوترس كويزز امبورتانتس انا زايا فروم مونغوليا يور ويتشر so interesting and funny, make more lessons. I, 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 I watch that when I get lazy. Um, <laughs> anyway, here's just, these are more pictures of, of Khan Academy being used all over the world. And whenever I see this and we get these letters, you know what I tell everyone involved, and you know, to be clear, Khan Academy is much more than me now. Uh, we have a, 150 full-time employees. We have, I think, the number something like 14,000 people who have helped translate subtitle videos. Obviously, there's uh, all of the people working at the NGOs and teachers, uh, uh, take, you know, actually working with the students. And what I tell all the stakeholders of Khan Academy, and you know, I hope I'm not presumptuous. I I, I view y'all as part of this mission, uh, more so than frankly most of the audiences that I might ever speak to, is that if if you know a free world class education for anyone anywhere, it was never imagined that it, it would somehow be done with, you know, by one person or even one organization, that it's, it's really going to be a, a collaborative effort. We're going to work on some content, some tools, hopefully in collaboration with y'all, but then it's, it's how do you work it in the classroom, how do you, how do you uh, create access so that students even have access to computers in the internet? There's, there's a million questions that we have to uh, address together. But I'll, I'll leave you with a little thought experiment just so that we can appreciate what's possible uh, as, as a group. If you were to go back in time 400 years to Western Europe, which even then it was one of the more literate parts of the planet, you would have seen about 15% of the population was literate, about 20% of men and 10% of women. And I suspect that if you ask someone who was literate, say a member of the clergy, what percentage of the population do you think is even capable of reading? They might have said, well, with a great education system, maybe 40%, maybe 50%. Well, you fast forward 400 years, we know that that would have been a wildly pessimistic prediction, that pretty close to 100% of the population is capable of reading. But if I were to ask all of y'all today, what percentage of the population is capable of writing the next great novel, or starting the next Google, or deeply understanding uh, physics, or contributing to cancer research, or becoming teacher of the year, uh, you might say, oh, well, you know, today that's sub 1%. Uh, maybe with a great education system, Maybe it could be 10%, maybe it could be 20%. But what if we're making that same estimation with the same blinders on that, that that clergy member might have made 400 years ago? The blinders of, the, of, of just what we've observed, a world where you know, we were all kind of pushed ahead, we're accumulating a gap here, there, here, there. We saw a lot of our peers, you all see students every day, where at some point the gaps become so large that they hit a wall. And that wall is often in an algebra class or in a physics class, but it could be in any class. It could be in your English class, in your history class. And it's not. And they hit that wall not because algebra is difficult or because they're not bright. It's because they didn't really master decimals and fractions and, and negative, something that completely can be uh, remediated. And so if you had a world where they could fill in those gaps, those Swiss cheese gaps, maybe the actual number could be quite higher. Maybe it could be 30%, 40%, 50%. And every day that goes on, I'm becoming more and more convinced that that number actually could be a lot closer to the number for literacy. That could be 80, 90, even 100%. And if we pull that off, and you know, free world class education for anyone anywhere, that 
that's that's what mass public education was all about. That's what has made you know if you look at uh, the, the the wealthiest countries in the world, you know, United States, Western Europe, um, uh, uh, Japan. These were the first countries that had public education, and so it's not a coincidence that these were the first to industrialize. These were the first to have a high standard of living. But I think the opportunity that we can do together is take everything to the next level. And if we can get that level of a of a free world class education, so it just becomes like clean drinking water or basic shelter and just a fundamental human right. Thank you. I will let you take the pause for a moment. Um, we're going to do a little bit of Q&A now, so, uh, so get your questions ready. We'll have some microphones moving around. But Sal, thank you so much for sharing that uh, moving, fascinating, and hilarious uh, uh, talk with us. It was, um, yeah, it, was, it was really inspiring, and thank you for everything that you're doing with Khan Academy. Um, I want to address, though, first up, I'm going to ask the first question, and then I'm going to pass it over to the audience. Uh, the, uh, the question that I'm sure you get asked a ton, and I just want to deal with it head on and get it out of the way. And you dealt with a lot of it in the presentation, but people who say, I don't just want my kid in front of a computer all day. Computers can't replace teachers. I don't want them to just be an automated robot that's just going through things online. How do you respond when people um, put that to you? Yeah, I, I mean, this is, you know, I, I, I remember in the early days when, um, you know, Khan Academy was, was uh, you know, first getting on people's radar. and. Uh, you, you know, you, I, I would look at some, some of, of the criticism, which would be exactly that. Like, hey, you know, this isn't, uh, you know, the, the important part of teaching happens when there's a human in the room and when you are interacting and it's not just about a screen. And it was funny because I, I couldn't have agreed more with some of our strongest critics. And I think sometimes what, you know, what happens is, um, you know, the press or whatever, they like to take a narrative like, hey, this could be like Amazon for education or something like that. Uh, but it is one of those things that we are constantly saying, no, th th this is not what we believe. And, you know, as I mentioned, I, you know, I've been running summer camps forever. I've, I've always dreamt of starting a school, and, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But the, um, I, I think the, the, you know, what I write in, in my book is it's all about what can technology do to allow humans to be human? And uh, you know the, the first talk, TED talk I, I gave. It you know there, there's a lot of debate sometimes about student to teacher ratio, and you know obviously uh, the lower the better. But what what I think technology can ironically optimize is student to valuable time with the teacher ratio, or student to human time with the teacher ratio. And so you know the situations if you're if you're Sultana or you're Zaya or if you're in a really under resourced school someplace in you know. Yes, yeah, some of them might be heavily reliant on that, but that is not ideal. Uh, the ideal is you have a real classroom with real resources, with an incredible teacher, and that this, you know, education's a whole spectrum of things. You know, at, at this end is just your basic, you know, almost you know, recall of things. Then your, uh, you know, you can imagine, you know, Bloom's taxonomy. You know, here, here you have your your understanding, your synthesis, your value, and then here you have your creation. And because there's so much to cover in a traditional model. Even though teachers want to focus here, they have to spend a lot of time here. And I think the opportunity is if technology can do some of this and even help out with some of the stuff up here, it's not like there's an end to what's there. Then you can do a lot more of the interesting stuff when you're in a classroom. And the teachers I talk to, that's why they became a teacher. They, they, they want those personal connections with the students. Uh, they want to be able to meet each of the students uh, where they are. And so, uh, you know, and, and one way to, you know, to, to really show that this is what we believe is that that's why we started the lab school is, you know, a lot of people said, hey, well, y'all are a virtual thing. Why would you start a physical school? This doesn't scale, et cetera. And it's like, no, we're doing this to show how important the physical experience is and what could the physical experience look like in a world where some of these types of tools uh, exist. And I think, and, and I was happy to hear that y'all are going to be able to tour, but, um, I think you know we actually have done a little bit of you know auditing of the students of like how much time are you with another human being how much time are you interacting how much time are you outside how much time are you creating versus passively and those are kind of the benchmarks for what we say these are success and so um, everything that we look at you know we have a whole uh, I don't know we have several members of our Khan Academy team here that those are all the people who work with teachers and try to understand what teachers need how do we improve the tools so that we can have more classrooms that are that are liberated in this way. 
Yeah, I've, I've been fortunate enough to visit the Khan Lab School, as some people here will tomorrow, and it's clear that the screen is not the primary uh, element of those schools. Um, okay, let's go to the audience. Who's got a, who's got a question for Sal? Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, first of all. That was unbelievable and inspiring. Really appreciate what you're doing. Um, I'm not a teacher of the year. I'm a coordinator. My teacher is Cicely right there. Cicely, raise your hand. She's awesome. <laughs> Woohoo, Tennessee! <laughs> Uh, so what I'm wondering is, since your background was in business and software, how did you learn all of the things about what makes a great teacher? No, and I, look, you know, this is y'all were talking about, you know, talk about having an imposter complex, especially in this in this room right over here. Um, you know, I, I think I, I think the valuable thing for me was, you know, I, this is something that I always that was always interesting to me. Uh, you know, so, sometimes it's, but even the story I just told and the, the press narrative sometimes is like, yeah, this guy like he was working in finance and he just on a whim decided to become. You know, it, it, that's not exact. I you know, it, I think it started in high school where, you know, it might not surprise people that I was the president of the math club, and. Uh, <laughs> But but uh, but but a big part of that actually was we used to run these like tutoring programs and uh, with our peers uh, and volunteer and the one th and I remember thinking this in high school because I was in uh, I was on the wrestling team and I was not a strong member of that team but I was uh, I was on the wrestling team and I was always intrigued by the difference that I sometimes saw with what happened in wrestling practice and what so sometimes happened in, in in the classroom where in wrestling practice like the coach would be like. Hey, I want you to go run 10 miles. Like, yes, sir. You know, you're right. I want to do 50%. I'm going to do it. I mean, these painful things. But and but most of practice was also interacting. That you know, the we had a kid on our team who was the state champion, and then he was our captain, and he would go around and do tutorial. And and then I would think about the difference of and, and if I had a gap in my wrestling skills, there was there was always someone there who could help me fill in that gap. Um, but that what happened, and I had an incredible math teacher, Mr. Hernandez, who you know I'm still uh, very close to, um, and I, I credit him for a lot of my success. Uh, it, you know, I, I used to talk to because he was the advisor for the math club, and and he used to say like, yeah, it's it's so frustrating. He wished he could run his class like that, the way that the wrestling team runs, where most of the class time were students working on what they need to work. But he used to show me what he had to cover in a year. And he used to show me this. I was like, oh, man. And, and, and then I used to see in the tutoring that when we did have an opportunity to, to address some of these gaps, some of these kids that were failing classes could actually uh, race ahead. So that was the first time I started thinking about it. Um, I think we've all had the experience of a lot of friends, who, and even ourselves, where uh, you know, they can beat you at chess, but all of a sudden they failed algebra class. And you're like, why did that happen? Uh, or all of a sudden you get to some point where you're like, I don't understand this class anymore. Uh, but it, it, it's probably because I didn't pay attention to the one before it, or, or whatever it is. So there was all these things, and I and I and even in college, I tried to I had had a fellowship to try to uh, work on software for education. I I got rejected for the Rhodes Scholarship twice because I wanted to study get a PhD in education. Um, so I kept getting, getting thrown away from 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 that. But yeah, it, it ended up at the end of the day fall, falling into it. Um, I, I will say that even the hedge fund. It, it definitely helped that it's a it was a, a remunerative career uh, and things like. But the reason why I was really intrigued by it is it was an opportunity to kind of like learn about the world. That one one moment you would have to think about how you know tanker prices are affecting the economy of Japan, and the next thing you're talking about a biotech. So I've always you know the biggest joy in in life, the the thing that makes us most human is is learning. And, and so I think um, it, I, it was always a high for me to be able to work with my cousins initially to engage in some of this beautiful material. And I think now one of my indulgences is, you know, I've gone beyond, I've, I've even done some stuff, and I'm not the only person making content on Khan Academy, but I definitely have gone beyond, you know, my original expertise, uh, where, you know, recently I've, I've done videos on the Constitution. But what I view as what's so exciting is, I, you know, I, I get to dig into it in a way that you don't get to dig into it when you're in college, or because I'm like, I'm going to do it for the passion and for the interest of it. And all of this stuff is incredibly interesting. And I'm blessed now to have, you know, if I have a question, I can call up some people and say, hey, you know, you're, you're a famous judge. How does this work? Uh, <laughs> And, and but I, I think it's like a you know a, a, a learner's dream, uh, and and the least that I can do is kind of help uh, share some of that and and, and help. And y'all are doing it every day. You know I, I still miss that time that I used to have with my cousins. And actually that's another selfish reason why I personally uh, run some of the seminars at the lab school because I just need that energy with students um, to 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 kind of keep doing what what we're trying to do. 
Uh, I, this is a question that doesn't necessarily have to deal with Khan Academy, but I'm interested in you. Your thoughts are through a lens that, that's, that's remarkable, and, and you're a very interesting person. Who's your favorite teacher you. of all time? Oh. If you look back on your life, an influential teacher that, that had an impact, would you describe that teacher to me? So I would say there's three that immediately come to mind, although if I, or maybe four, if, if, if I dig deeper, I could, I mean, there's probably 20. Um, uh, you know, Mr. Hernandez was one of them. I think what really stood out, why he was so important to me, was uh, he was my Algebra two teacher, and uh, you know, he was the advisor for the, the math club and the math team. But he, he kind of treated me like an equal uh, in a lot of ways. I mean, I, he was my mentor in a lot of ways, but he, he, he was the first teacher that I didn't view as like a teacher. Like he would show, he was kind of vulnerable. He was like, hey, this is what I got to do and this and that. And it was the first time that I had like this deep empathy. And also he believed in me. I mean, he wrote my recommendations for MIT. I, you know, I, I was, there aren't a lot of kids that go from Metro Louisiana to no one. And he's the guy that told me, no, like, you know, I think you should apply. I think you should. And I was like, no one from our school has ever gone. Like what is, and, and so I think for him for sure, uh, Miss Kennedy, who is actually our journalism uh, uh, teacher, uh, I was on the school newspaper, and uh, and it was a class at the high school that I went to, Grace King High School, and she ran that class like a like a newspaper, like a real newspaper, and so I think what was really powerful is once again she treated me like a like a member of the team. There wasn't the separation between teacher student. If you go earlier, I remember in second grade, and this is kind of one of my earliest formative experiences. Um, you know, it's funny, my, my sister was always like the, the high achiever, uh, and she was in all the gifted classes and all that. I thought I was in gifted until I realized it was speech therapy. And, <laughs> but, but because of my sister, because of my sister, they kept testing me. And they're like, oh, surely that last test, because Farah is so strong. Surely her brother, they kept, I'm serious, and I don't think most kids get this opportunity to keep getting tested. Um, but I eventually did end up in the program, and, and the first day I showed up, and I remember it was in second grade, and it was this weird thing where every day they would take you out of a different class period to go to this program. I walked into this room, and it was Miss Krause and Miss Roussel, and I was seven years old, but like the, the memory seared in my head, and it was like a classroom like I had never seen before. You know, it, the, it wasn't all the tables in, in one direction. It was, there was a bunch of kids, mixed ages, all doing different things. Some were playing chess, some kids were drawing. And I was like, what is this secret world that I fall in myself? And then and they said, oh, you're new, come here. And, and there were two teachers and they said, so what are you interested in? And I was like, are you asking me? You know, I was, <laughs> I, was like, I like to draw. They're like, well, then we'll draw. I like puzzles, so we'll do puzzles. And I thought like I was getting away. I was like, I can't tell anyone about this. <laughs> this is some type of scam that's being run within the school. Um, but when I really think about some of my, de I mean, I don't remember a lot more of, you know, second grade, but I remember those those moments. So I think that the theme is is that when I was able to have human interactions uh, and get that one on one time, you know, even one thing we try to do at the lab school is every student gets at least 15 minutes one on one with a teacher every week, um, and it might not sound like a lot, but if we all introspect on how much. You know, those one-on-one -on -one moments with caring adults are the, t the stuff that's, that's seared in, into, your, into your head. And so I think uh, those, are the, those are the teachers that have um, had, had a really big, you know, there was also a teacher at the University of New Orleans, uh, Dr. Jairo Santania, that took me under his wing when I was in high school, because I was taking a few courses there. And he's also the one, like, you should do this, you should think about this. You know, I didn't have access to a computer at, at my house, and so he, he lent a computer to me so I could learn to program. So, I mean, there's some incredible uh, teachers. I mean, I could keep going. Yeah. When I came back into teaching three years ago, um, I was asked to be a long-term sub as a uh, advanced algebra teacher. I am not a mathematician. <laughs> I'm a social studies teacher. And I survived three weeks of teaching advanced algebra and moving the kids forward because I could go home at night and I could work Khan Academy. <laughs> <laughs> Problem. I, I want to, if you're willing, that could be a great, we, great testimonial. We have so long to do that. Happy to do that. Free, free, I, I'm free. It's easy. Okay. Okay. Right? <laughs> so as you, when you deal with math and science, you're in sort of a black and white world. Mm -hmm. As you move into the humanities, though, and as you move into social studies, now you get into more partisan subjects. So how are you dealing with that uh, in, your, in your content? Yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating, and, and um, 
Yeah, and I'm learning all sorts. Of, I remember, I mean, I did this on a whim. Uh, I don't, it was about six, seven years ago. There was, I read like a news report that's like, you know, the CIA had declassified some of their interventions that they had done in other countries during the Cold War. And like, there was this thing about um, Allende, how they overthrew him. And, 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 and I was like, well, this is incredible. I'm going to make a video on this. And so I actually, I went to CIA.gov, I took the primary documents of like, you know, so I'm, this isn't like, you know, Sal's made up conspiracy theory type. This is like the, the CIA has released these documents, but this is a really valuable part of history. And so, you know, I, I said this happened and it was fast. As soon as I uploaded it, the comments just started to come in. Uh, a lot of American kids were like, well, no, I appreciate you did this, but I don't think you are uh, fair to the CIA because you have to understand at that time, we were afraid of communism taking a, 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 a good point. But then I started getting like, you are an imperialist pig. <laughs> you have whitewashed the history of my country. My uncle died in that intervention, killed by your CIA. And, and I was like, this didn't happen in, 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 well, first of all, this doesn't happen in algebra videos. And, and second of all, this didn't happen in, in the, the world history or the current events classes that, that I remember. And then I said, well, why didn't it happen? Uh, you know, why, why didn't a, a Chilean kid walk in the room, you imperialist pig, this is our view, view of history. And so I think there's two takeaways here is, you know, obviously at Khan Academy, we want to be, you know, it's, it's, it's impossible to be biased list. We all grew up in a certain context and a certain, but as much as possible, we, you know, I think when people watch anything from Khan Academy, they feel like, wow, it's, it's hard to tell whether Sal's a Democrat or Republican. It's hard to tell what their political leanings are. It's hard to say if he's religious or if he's not religious. It's hard to, and, and, I, and I think everything about Khan Academy has to be like that. But at the same time, because it's out there, because it's out in the open, it's, it's transparent, it's there for the world to, to, to kind of to, to say, no, that, one, we, we leave those, as long as people are respectful on the comments, we leave them out there. People can say, I disagree, I, this is wrong, this is, um, and, and I think that's, you know, that's, that's the way these things should work. It, I, it's, it's, it actually is already starting to be a little bit more challenging in other countries. Um, that are a little bit more sensitive <laughs> about about some of these things. So, so it isn't. It's still an open question about you know, in in an Iran, uh, and I don't know if this is made public, but uh, edit this part out. But but <laughs> you know, are, are is it you know should we just go with the math and science first uh, because some of the other stuff might be so controversial or in a China or whatever. So th that that is a question that we're trying to think about right now. So I um, teach immigrant and refugee students in Spokane, and my question is always about access, because we take for granted that all of our students have access, because most of them have smartphones, but we, they don't have data plans. Mm -hmm. They just use them for phone, for taking pictures, or listening to music, or playing games. Um, and they have to have Wi-Fi access in order to be able to access this kind of content. And I think we as educators often do that as well. We assign, you know, go to Khan Academy, do this. And then we don't realize that in order to do that, they have to go to the library, sign up for 30 minutes. Um, and then we also have uh, Wi-Fi. You know, you can get Wi-Fi for $5.99 a month. And then you find out that it's like slow as molasses mm -hmm. and you can't actually look at video you can maybe read some text sometimes. Mm. So how you mentioned that you're um, talking about access and you're trying to figure out how we do that. So how do we, with things like net neutrality and things like that, how are, we go how are you going about ensuring that literally it is a world-class education for anyone, anywhere? Yeah, that's another central question for us that we are, you know, we, you know, we're not a big telecom company, and we, you know, we're we're still relatively small in, in the whole scheme of things. So there's two ways we think about it. One is, okay, we look at the trends, and I, you know, we wish we could reach every single student that had, you know, so they had access today. But we know that's not the reality. But hey, in five years, in seven years, in ten years, it's going to be much more of a reality. So let's build for that. It's not the best answer, but that's kind of one of the things that we, we can only do. The other thing is we can use, even though we're small, we have a voice now. You know, we work very closely with Google. We work uh, very closely with Comcast in other countries, um, uh, tel, uh, Telcel in um, uh, tel, uh, Telmex in, in, um, in Mexico. Um, we're working with all of these people to, to one, advocate, like so that the, the 599 or the 1099 is actually real internet. Um, you know, there are uh, 
uh, in a tel cell in Mexico, they've actually zero rated. Um, so you know, in, in Mexico, most people are are prepaid on their data plan, but if you access Khan Academy, it doesn't hit your data plan. Um, and so I, I think things like that are are solutions that we want to explore uh, with in, in other countries. Um, and you know, the the argument I make there is. You know, there's a reason why public education is free. Um, it, and, and there's a reason why an ambulance, everyone clears off the road when an ambulance is going all down the road. And I, and, and I do argue that that you know, education, not just Khan Academy, but anything that is going to be really useful for students should get that type of, you know, they shouldn't have to pay for that. And you know, by the way, from the state's point of view, it is, it is such a, you know, someone wants to learn, and the only reason they're not is because of that. Like that seems really silly from just even if you're if you're thinking about the future of your your nation of your, or your state. So yeah, we advocate. You know, Google does a ton, uh, uh, and they've helped us even in the Bay Area here. They've distributed Chromebooks to, for classrooms that have done some really incredible things. So yeah, we just try to use our voice to to help influence uh, you know the bigger bigger players. <laughs> Simple answer. Sal, thank you so much for coming and um, speaking with us this morning. Um, please, everyone, join me. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.